I was once known by another name. Any sorcerer will have more than one name, of course, but my original name, my boyhood name, if you like, was Adric. That sounds like a Saxon name. Doesn't it just? Do we really need to get carried away with the details, hairball? As I was saying, even I was young once. I was in the South, a mere teenager at the height of the Norman invasion. The Battle of Hastings had ended in disaster, and my home village as one of those that lay in the path of the Duke of Normandy's army. Unsurprisingly, they made short work of us. Got to hand it to Duke William. Oh, he was thorough, a man after my own heart. And if he caught me, he'd probably have had it too, sliced out of my chest with a broadsword. That's what he did to all the other prisoners he took that day, after all. You want us to feel sorry for you? Certainly not. There's nothing more disgusting than pity. Oh, I don't know. I can think of something worse we're talking to right now. I was one of the few to escape. I fled north where resistance to the invaders was far stronger. I was taken in by an old man, a farmer near the city of York. He claimed he was the great-grandson of a Viking who had settled in the land during the reign of King Canute. I was too young to know the difference, so I believed he was a Viking. Nowadays, I'd have recognized him at once as a Celt. You must understand, I can promise you no safety from these Norman soldiers. Should they come this far north, then I can see no reason in the world for them to stay away. This farm is as likely as any other place to be taken by them. But they may not burn it. You won't let them know where I'm from, that's all I ask. No, I shan't. Betrayal is not in my field of expertise. Doesn't mean I'll take you on as a hand, though. Oh, but you must. You have so much land to tend on your own, sir. Hmm. Well, you seem strong enough for a lad of such tender years. Yes, I believe you can help me tend the fields, at least during harvest time. You won't be sorry, Master Nimrod. I just need someone to give me a chance. I won't take my living for granted, I promise. I want to earn my keep. An attitude that does you credit, young one. And with such enthusiasm, why should we not start a labour straight away? There are tools here for you to begin sowing the seeds. Let us go to work. Thank you so much, Master Nimrod. Thank you, thank you. By criminy, I was hideous back then. So full of sincerity, so enthusiastic, so naive. Can you believe I even had ideals and principles? Dear, oh dear, I wasn't a pretty sight. You was an idealist, Fisher. That's like catching the plague. Sure felt like it. Did you live? Oh, yes. You should see me now. Nimrod. I think we can all work out who that was. While Duke William was establishing himself as the new king, Merlin and I worked together for several years, just toiling away tediously for our survival, until the Normans burned the north to put down the rebellion of York. Our farm was one of the many that were burned. Edric! Edric! Quickly, my boy! The Baron's men have already reached the inner field! I haven't had a chance to collect the talisman from inside the house, Master! I'll go and collect it now! No, Edric! Edric! Wait! I'll only be a moment, Master! We don't have a moment, Edric! How right he was, and how foolish I was. The Normans were on us before I had a chance to reach the rotting wooden shack we laughingly called a house. They pounded on the door, but I refused to come out. And when one of them tried to force his way in, I agonized him with a pitchfork. The others responded by setting the house aflame while I was still sealed inside. No! Master! Master, help me! I'm here, my boy. Master, how did you get... Never mind that now, young one. Take my hand. Now... Spell casting. W A R P. What he'd done was cast a spell that took us no distance at all in space, but over a century forward in time. It was then that I realized what I had really become involved with. My master was not merely some dotedly old farmer stumbling through life, battling each day just to survive long enough to see another dawn. He was a sorcerer. I had been taken in by a powerful sorcerer. Merlin was your stepfather? Interesting way of putting it. He took you in, nurtured you, gave you a life to live, and look at you now. You've repaid him by becoming the very antithesis of all he stood for. Don't be sanctimonious, old goat. He let me down. He had all that power, but he was still so weak he failed me. Failed you? Oh, stop whining, bone brain. Merlin was a dim-witted old burke, but he never let you down. He failed me! I was trapped in that shack while it was burning round my ears. You think I came out of that ruin unscathed or something? I take it you didn't, then. Half of my face was burned off. And that demented old fool could have saved me from that. 
If he hadn't been so squeamish about revealing that he was a wizard, he could have rescued his own stupid talisman by a single click of his fingers. But no, he was more interested in keeping his powers a secret from me. From me? After I'd spent nearly three years working as a virtual slave for him. He didn't trust me enough to protect me. If he no trust you, maybe this Merlin no so stupid as I'd like to believe, huh? He was still stupid enough. And cowardly. But once his hand was forced, he had to admit to me who he really was. He cast a spell to heal my face, but again he botched it. Funny. The more I hear about him, the more I like him. He always sounded like a brat from what I heard. Oh, he was worse. He used magic to repair the tissue of my face and cleanse the scorching, but he ended up bleaching my body altogether. Uh, so that's how you appear the way you do. Only partly, Treyguard, only partly. In the months that followed, I inevitably became more and more curious about the ways of magic. I soon started begging Merlin to train me in the arts, but he refused time and again, insisting that he didn't believe I was of the right mind to handle it. Me? Not of the right mind? When I've become the greatest wizard under the earth? Ha! If only he could see me now. He'd see he was right. Everything he feared about you has come true. He wasn't afraid that you couldn't learn to use magic, he was afraid that you wouldn't use it responsibly, and look at what you've become. You corrupt every bit of magic you have with the stench of technology, and you've lost what little sense of morality you ever had. Don't bleat to me about morality, Treyguard. It's the classic lament of the bad loser. Show me a good loser, and I'll show you a loser. Show me a loser, and I'll show you a mirror. Eventually, I persuaded Merlin of a self-evident fact. He had failed to use his powers when they were needed. Therefore, he was the irresponsible wizard. Therefore, he owed me. So he relented, and he began schooling me in his outdated little so-called arts of pure magic. And my progress was fast, and, I thought at the time, without limit. But there was just one problem. What's that? You're fishing. Merlin was an imbecile. He couldn't teach a newborn baby how to cry. Now then, young Edric, if you'll turn to page 3163, we will look at and discuss... What will we look at and discuss? Ah, yes, of course. Controlling the weather with magic. Yes. Now then, the first spell we will look at is... Thundara. This spell summons up a miniature thunderstorm cloud. Now repeat after me. Yes, master? I've forgotten spell. Oh no, I haven't. Spell casting. T H U N D A R A. Spell casting. T H U N D A R A. Oh, fiddlesticks, my lesson notes. They're getting soaked. Ah, uh, the spell. A R A D N U H T. Ah, uh, that's better. Oh, oh bother. Uh, can you take a break while I dry these things out? And it went on like that, day in, day out, with the old fool trying to teach me the ways of pure magic. He couldn't even see how limiting the old arts were, how unreliable the methods are without other, more visionary factors to guide and drive them. I could tell there was something missing even back then, but I still had no idea what it was. I might have still followed his instructions, of course, if only he weren't such an incompetent dodderer. After a good start, I soon found I was no longer learning anything, merely watching an old man clowning with powers he no longer had the skill to control. Even then, Merlin still had ten times the knowledge, vision, and skill you have now, Lord Fear. You can't even see how- Oh, hush. One day, years later, he inadvertently told me everything I needed to know to break through the impasse of sorceress knowledge I had so long wished to escape. By now, we've taken up residence in the very dungeon to be found beneath your own castle, Treyguard. Master, we must be a hundred feet below the ground. How come this chamber is still standing under the weight of all that stone? You are mistaken, my boy. We are not a hundred feet below ground, at least not in the sense you mean. We are wherever the dungeon wishes us to be. I'll never understand this place, but we should explain it to me properly. 
one day when you've learned enough to understand it. For now, I shall explain this particular chamber to you. It looks like a study. Funny place to find one, though. Indeed it is. This, my dear Edric, is the Hall of Folly. It's nothing to do with a certain fellow who can occasionally be found lurking in a dungeon. Well, not too much to do with him, at any rate. In the books you'll find throughout this library are ten lifetimes worth of knowledge regarding magic and its myriad history. You will learn much from these books, my young apprentice, so study them well, for you will need the knowledge for the day when you will inevitably face my alter ego. Your what? Mogdred. He is the dark side of my magic, and even of my nature, and if your destiny as a sorcerer is ever to be fulfilled, you must one day overcome him. I am training you, my dear boy, so that you may help me finally to vanquish him. I'm honoured that you feel I'm worthy to help you, Master. Yes, my boy. I believe you will be the one who finally reads the dungeon of Mogdred. Now go to your studies. Read any book you like from these shelves here. But stay away from that group of books to the right. They are entirely about theoretical magic. I merely keep them for my personal study and interest. As their content is entirely unpracticed, and probably impossible to accomplish at all, they can do no good to any pupil's studies. Well, why is that? They would only serve to confuse you. You will only be equipped to study these theories once you have fully grasped the intricacies of pure sorcery. If you study theoretics now, you will probably never fulfil your basic skills. I see. All right, then. But I can read all the rest. Certainly. All of them can teach you many a unique secret, and all those secrets are valuable to a student of the parasciences. Now, if you'll excuse me, I must confer with the dungeon master. I can trust you to behave while I'm gone. Oh, really, master? It was my 20th birthday a month ago, and you're still treating me like a brat. I apologise, young man. Study well. You may notice notice that I didn't actually actually answer his question. question. The old fool couldn't trust trust me to behave. behave. Nonetheless, I decided decided at first to be a good little student and stayed away from those forbidden books. And Merlin was right about one thing. The other books were all treasures of magical knowledge. Knowledge written by some of the finest minds in the history of parascience, such as Le Locan, Le Fay, Ambrosius, Hearn, Cadmon. So many tomes of ancient knowledge dating back even to Roman times. Magic at its purest and most timeless. I think I learned more in a single day studying in that library than I had in the previous three years of listening to Merlin droning on. Hey, he didn't have to teach you anything at all. Probably explains why he didn't. In any case, after studying there for several days, I eventually stumbled across a tome of real curiosity for me. It was written by a druid calling himself Toldris the Enchanter, and it included a brief treatise on the inadequacies of pure magic, including the very limited range beyond which any wizard's power would reach an impasse. Above all, he condemned the arcane and obscure practices of traditional teachings, their complete disregard for advancements in other fields, and the unreliable and unpredictable outcomes of sorcery that was not tempered by other forces. Unbelievable! You're saying the first written advocate of technomancy was a druid? Not exactly. He was just the first sorcerer to make a public rejection of pure magic as outmoded, and to call for a reformation of practices. But a druid? There's no one more likely to be in tune with the spirits of land and water. Which is why he was in an ideal position to know what I had grown to suspect for myself. For those spirits and elements are unreliable. We need them to provide the power for sure, but we need something more earthly, more of our own creation and understanding to guide that power and to drive it. It's the only way we can be sure that our magic is going to work. Why you never see it wrong? Magic is magic for a reason. It meant to be above man, not changed by man. It meant to be touched by man. It's not meant to be part of man's creation. And who wrote those rules, Majida? Why, the top sorcerers, of course, the big guns of their own time. Well, this is my time, and now I'm the big gun. That means I decide what the rules are. Anyway, I'm glad you find the concept so far to be disturbing. means I'm winning. But my story is not yet done. For what I had found was merely some archaic Latin thesis discrediting pure magic. Very interesting stuff, of course, but crucially, it didn't suggest any practical alternatives. But it did offer one other thing. A reference that Toldris wrote on the very final page of his thesis. Computato ergo sum. I compute, therefore I am. And the significance of that is? I recognised the term from somewhere and looked around the rest of the library. Then I saw it. It was the title of another book. There! Wait, damn, it's one of the books Merlin told me not to read. 
Decisions, decisions, eh? Obey my dear master's instructions or learn the knowledge I so desperately needed to finally make my education worth something. Oh, and it took a second thought, I bet, face it. Not even a first, forward old donkey. I took the book off the shelf and started flipping through it at once. What a surprise I had when I discovered that it was written by Mogdred himself. Mogdred? Enthralling stuff. Believe it or not, he was the one who invented the philosophy of technomancy. I don't believe you. He might have practiced dark magic, but he was still a purist. It doesn't matter what you believe, old thing. Amazing though it is, seeing I'm the one who overthrew him, Mogdred was the necromancer to whom I owe the full glory of my entire philosophy. He theorized that by using magic not merely as the fuel, but also as the vessel, mages were forever reducing the potency of their own spells. He demonstrated conclusively that using magic as its own vessel was an unnecessary drain on its resources when there were forces in the physical world more than capable of the menial side of the task. What was needed was the interaction of physical components into a single vessel, powered by the magic itself. This fusion would be infinitely more efficient, its results infinitely more calculable. He even created an early prototype machine, albeit not a very impressive one, which he ended up deploying as a patrolman at the upper levels. You mean the automated? You're convinced of techno-sorcery's power by a slow, lumbering run of tin like that? It was only an early model tray guard, an experiment simply to assess whether his theory is workable in practice. All the shortcomings and weaknesses of the robot were simply to be expected with such fledgling technology. But the experiment was still an unqualified success because it proved conclusively that the theories were sound. The automaton required the barest expenditure of magic in order to function, and the machinery did the rest. For the first time it was there for all to see. Technology and sorcery could be fused into an efficient, workable whole. Let's assume for a moment that we believe a word of this face-ache. What happened then? I stole the tome and hid it in my quarters. Every moment of spare time during the next few months I devoted to study of the forbidden art, as I read the book many times over, trying to memorize every last detail. Once I'd found the nerve to do so, I finally started experimenting secretly with some of the design ideas suggested in it. But then, one day, inevitably, I was caught red-handed. I knew it! I knew you'd do something like this! This was why I never wanted to tutor you magic in the first place. I knew you were too impetuous, too arrogant. Arrogant? Me? You've got a memory that makes your average pet goldfish look like an oracle, and you still claim to be the greatest sorcerer who ever lived. Now you're calling me arrogant. Don't be impertinent. Look what you've done with those metallic components. It's disgusting. What the devil are you trying to build? Oh, feast your eyes, master. It'll take me years still, but when it's done, it'll be the world's first properly functional robot. I plan to call it Dreadnought. By all the gods of all the rivers and all the lands of all the world. All right, you can stop gasping in apoplexy now, Greyface. Prolonged expressions of horror can really start to grate by the time you hit the fourth subclause. Cool, though, isn't it? The Dreadnought, I mean. It's hideous! It's an obscene corruption of everything I spent years trying to teach you. Teach me? You haven't taught me one thing in the last two years that I didn't find out in my first week. Every time I complain, you just sniff at me to be patient or give me a practical demonstration that goes wrong. You don't know anything, Merlin. Your memory's shot to hell. I can probably remember more magic than you, and this is why. So that's how you've done this. You stole Mogdred's thesis from me. Seems fair, seeing you obviously stole it from him. Give it back, boy. You don't understand the consequences of what you're dealing with. This knowledge is dangerous. I, I promise I'm not angry. Just give it back and we'll say no more. Not angry? <laughs> Why would I be afraid anyway? What can you possibly do to harm me? I told you to give it back. Thanks for reminding me, but if I read things right, you're the one with the memory problems. This is your last warning. Don't force me to... To what? Attack me? Or am I supposed to laugh myself to death? I can do you much harm, Edric. Really? Well, seeing you think I'm the one with amnesia, old bean, you'd better remind me to tremble with terror. You leave me no alternative. Spellcasting! Ah, ah! The poor old fool didn't even realize that the Dreadnought wasn't my only techno-sorcery project. Knowing as I had at the outset that I could be discovered at any time, I chose to start off with a self-defense arrangement. No! Ah! What's that I see in your eyes, old thing? Fear? What a shame. 
I always planned to take my high sorcerer name in tribute to my first ever kill in the role. So I was hoping to see admiration in your eyes when I showed off my new fireball launches. I was hoping you'd be impressed, or proud, to see the skills of your apprentice as he puts them to use. Lord Impressor or Lord Pride, I liked those names. But hey, I'm not complaining. I reckon Lord Fear has a ring to it all its own.